What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Bischoff and Brown right here on the Detroit Lions podcast. He's Scott Bischoff. I'm Russ Brown. We are back for the week two preview of the Lions versus the Buccaneers. We are going to jump right into the Lions versus the Rams, the review of this game, what's good, what's bad, what's ugly from it, what stood out, all of that stuff. But before we jump into any of it, I got to introduce my co-host and my good friend, Scott Bischoff, my man. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We are good, man. We are good. We are one and all. The Lions are one and all. Uh, the not doing score predictions on the show is, is here. here. So <laughs> it, it remains undefeated. So we're just going to keep it rolling. Um, but no, we're good. It was very nerve wracking uh, with this game. Just, you know, we're going to jump right in. Lions are 1 0, but nerve wracking for a lot of different reasons, right? Like we didn't know what to expect from the offense, didn't know what to expect from the defense, a lot of young players defensively. Uh, but I will say, watching the film, watching the game, I've, I've watched the game live uh, twice, and I've rewatched the film now on both sides of the football. And I, and I will say, There was a lot of good that came from it. Certainly a lot of shaking off of the rust. I mean, a lot of starters did not play in the preseason. And I would say that right league-wide. I mean, how many unders can you hit in in week one on on the betting service? I hit a parlay with three unders on it, and I hate betting unders. So the week week one offenses were, I mean, it was was very obvious. And I would imagine the NFL is going to want to address this, but um, the preseason almost is not important enough. They're worried so much about injuries, yeah, that it isn't important enough for for any of these teams to come out just rolling, right? Yeah, uh, and that's pretty much everywhere across the league. All almost every offense just really struggled. I mean, they really did. So lives were no different, right? Um. And you honestly, know, you do. I don't, you know, I don't see a change there though. I, I don't know what they're going to do about that. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, the, the, the real only, I mean, I'm not going to say the only offense, but I mean, the Bucks offense looked pretty good. Uh, the, the Saints offense looked pretty good. I don't think they were playing very good football teams, but yeah. I, I will say that the Rams offense looked relatively good for the most part. And a lot of it was because they were getting the football out so quickly. And that's really where I want to start because I think that is what could hurt the Lions in the long run if they do not start adjusting some of their coverages in these games. And the reason I bring this up is, you know, Cody Alexander is a guy that I follow on Twitter uh, at Match Quarters. He's a great follow and he does weekly data on coverage usages across the NFL. And the Lions played true to who they are. They ran cover one almost 36% of the time. Outside of that, they ran cover three almost 22% of the time, the same thing with quarters coverage. They didn't have a lot of flat defenders. And the reason that is, is because our linebackers are so caught up in needing to play the run and they take those steps forward and getting out to the flats. It's just not going to really happen for the linebackers. And fortunately, they kind of get bailed out with the corners being able to kind of click and close to the flats and do those types of things. But Man, Stafford was getting rid of the football in in two point two seconds most times, and it just it, it was one of those things where it's like teams are going to find a way to attack you quickly with the passing game. So that's what my biggest worry was coming out of this game, and that was the thing that stood out defensively the most. But I will say, from a good standpoint, Levi Ozarike, holy shit, is he back? Is is our guy back here? I know we we were on the draft when we drafted him together, so yeah, that was one of the guys we liked. He had a, uh, you know, he had a really nice last third of the season last year. He really did. Um, You know, I don't totally know what his role is going to be. I I mean, is he is is he a three? Right with so I guess I say that from this sense, like DJ Reader should be playing this week, and you know, you know, Ali McNeil is going to get his snaps. So where does Onzerike fit in there? Is he a five? He's explosive enough to be, or at least he was in what we saw, you know, at college 
And we what we saw, I would say the the last four or five games last year, he looked like he looked like he was getting he was getting past the back injuries, and looked like he could, he could, you know, he he looked the part. I guess is what I would say. Um, obviously, in camp, he was making some noise. So yeah, it's it's awesome to have interior pass rush. It's a great thing. So yeah. I'm 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 bi- I guess I'm bitching a little bit that they have too much depth of talent on their interior of their O line or their their D line. Like please come on. Well, and it's and it's a, and it's a good problem to have because he yeah. had a he had a really strong start to week one in this season. He was um, second in quarterback hits with five, fourth in total pressures generated with five. Obviously, we all know that Aiden Hutchinson's a freak. He had 11 pressures tied for a league high. All this yeah. data, according to Pro Football Focus. I think I'm with you, though. Levi's probably going to be at three. He's he's more than likely going to be kind of that line stunt kind of guy where you run those ET stunts, those TE stunts. Um, and, and he did it a couple times with Marcus Davenport, who also, I thought, had a really good debut. I mean, he is strong, dude. He is powerful. He's a beast, uh, he is a beast turning speed to power, mm-hmm. but... It's interesting when you look at his splits. Um, so just a little bit of like, uh, all of us need to just kind of rein it in with him just a little. If you look at yeah. his splits when he's playing really uh, average or below average old lineman, he he eats right. But when he goes up against more technical, better offensive tackles, he struggles. Yeah. I just I'm not sure he can turn power on them like he can, you know the second stringers or whatever you want you want to call it. But yeah, I mean he had a really good day. Uh I thought Stafford was just obscene Sunday night. He was. He was it and this is a guy that just wants to while well, and get his shot against his former team and and prove to them that hey, you guys made a mistake of getting rid of me. I'm still the guy. I'm still the man. That's what it feels like. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's. it does feel like there's a little um, leftover tension or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, you Animosity. Know, it, it, yeah, whatever it is. I mean, there could be just a, a touch of it, but he played. I don't know that there's another quarterback – there are, as I say it coming out of my mouth, I want to take it back. There are quarterbacks who can do some of the things he he did in that game, but there's yeah. not a lot. And um, like looking forward, Baker's not that guy. I can't imagine uh, just the anticipation, the touch, the ridiculous. Uh, I'm I'm getting hit by four people, four defensive guys, and I'm just going to layer this throw out there. Past the sticks, no big deal. Yeah, like yeah, dude, come on! Like the, this is yeah. I, I wanted to say this is like total bullshit. Watching this, yeah, you know, well, and he and you know he Kudos. hit that a hundred percent. Kudos to him. Tough environment. Uh, I'm glad he still got booed because let's be honest, he didn't do anything here. He, sure, he won some games, but he never won big games. And it was it just is what it is. And and he's salty about maybe how things turned out last year to end the season for him. But I will say this, he did a really good job of just taking in the pressure that he was being faced with. And, you know, early in the game, he missed the throw to Demarcus Robinson on a crosser. Later in the game, he stood in there tall and took a shot and delivered that pass to Demarcus Robinson. It was a big yeah. pass. So it, well, it is what it is. You know, like, as Lions fans, we can recognize Matt Stafford is, an, is a, a very high level, even if you want to call him an elite quarterback, he is. Yeah. He's a fantastic quarterback. Um, he wasn't at times here, but I don't know that that's, you know, obviously that's not necessarily about him, yeah. but it just, it was time for him to go when, when, when he, when the trade was made, we can recognize how good he is. He, he's a fantastic mm-hmm. quarterback. He just, oh, yeah. like he played, it's like, there were so many throws where it was like, you know, they're almost like F you kind of throws like, right. Come on, man. I know. But, you know, um, the Lions played, in the end, I think the Lions played like a C-level game. Um, what I would consider to be maybe even below average for what they've shown us for a little while, both from yeah. play calling, coaching, um, you know, 
uh, the way that the way that the offense looked at times, the way the defense looked at times. I don't think the Lions played real well, right? So you managed to face a very dangerous team on Sunday night, not play a very good game, and then what's left, what everybody thinks about is what happens in overtime when you you just – it's just like – it's kind of like Michigan and Penn State in the second half. Like, yeah. Volleyball. Volleyball. Right. We're just – we don't even need to throw the ball, you know. Um, I mean, yeah, that's it's wonderful to be able to do that. It's just – it's really hard to do that. But when it came time – for for them to show up and for ben, ben Johnson to really dial up things, um, I know that most people don't consider a you know a coordinator dialing up things in the in the running game like oh it's just a run, but he did right. So you you went to a bunch of double teams and uh, kickout blocks and all this other stuff, and the Lions executed and that that was as clinical a drive as as there has been. Um, it was awesome to watch. Maybe that's because we're O line guys, right? Like so it's. <laughs> So it's a little more fun to watch, but uh, yeah. the overtime period was awesome. I thought that there were really interesting things. Like Terry and Arnold, to me, look like he is he's legit, and you can already see it. I know he gave up a few. Um, the NFL, I, I want to say Carlton Davis fell on on one coverage where they're going to say it was Davis's responsibility, but it wasn't. Uh, yeah. It's like a 24-yard gain or something like that, but... But to me, it didn't look like, and I guess I just want people to remember what it looked like at times with Cam Sutton last year where, yeah, he's covering the guy, whoever it was, the number ones, Justin Jefferson twice and Puka Nakua, yeah. all these things and Mike Evans and that stuff. But he wasn't really in phase in coverage where right. to me, Arnold looked in phase and in control and all that stuff. It's just he's a touch grabby, Right. And he's a he's touch grabby, and it's also his first game. He said it was yeah. the loudest atmosphere he had ever played in, of you know, from playing in the twelfth man at Texas A and M, all that stuff. It's like, yeah, it's probably a lot for him to kind of take in. He's a little nervous, probably, probably a little rusty. He hadn't really been part, practicing, though, right? He look he looks the part, right? Yeah. So, and, and I think we also have to remember that too. Like the Lions kind of got banged up during this this preseason and this summer with kind of odds and end injuries that that just kind of happened. So I think guys were shaking off the rust. And, and like the same thing with like St. Brown. Of course, I bet him for 60 yards receiving. He ends up with like 18 okay. yards, only get – right, gets gets three catches. And he looked like almost like a decoy out there so J-Mo could have his big day. And J-Mo stepped up to the task, five receptions, 121 yards, a touchdown. He had a carry for 13 yards. He played really well. And it he just goes to show – he could have had more, but it also yeah. goes to show like even if Laporta and, and St. Brown aren't necessarily playing their best, they can run the football with Montgomery and Gibbs. They can get the ball to JMO. They can spread the football around. And, and they didn't bring really Khalif Raymond in. They didn't really use Isaiah Williams. So I'll be very interested what week two is going to look like. And really the offensive line, it was the first time they had played together all summer. So yeah. they got some kinks to work out, but like you said, it was a C game, a, a graded C game or maybe an average game at best for them, and that's okay. They got the win. The Lions of old would have lost that game 20 to 17, and yeah. Matt Stafford would have thrown a pick in the fourth quarter or would have got down and maybe won, maybe they probably would have lost that game. So they they have and, and uh you know, I don't you hope it's the the last time you have to see the Rams because it's just like that's a trouble that that they're tough, man. That that's a tough that's team a trap spot. Yeah, and I don't know what you saw from Jared Verse, but dude, like, wow, because he him is Byron. He played, man. Wow, him, Byron Young, and Kobe Turner. That is going to be a trio up front for them. Not necessarily this year, but next year and moving forward, they are going to be very good up front. Yeah, and if they can figure out the future at quarterback, and if Sean McVay sticks around, that's going to be a good football team for yeah. for quite some time. I mean, yeah, I they just I don't want to. As a Lions fan, I don't want to have to deal with playing them again. But yeah. the nice thing is, is that I think the Rams are a pretty good football team, as evidence. You, we saw it right, and you saw them without either starting tackle, and then yeah. more injuries, right? And you still saw them hang in there against a really good team on the road. Yeah. Um, that's a really good win. And I think as we go along, 
we obviously don't know right now, but as we go along, that's going to look like a better win than than we even realize right now. At the end yeah. of the season, that's going to be a huge win for them. Hundred percent. A hundred. Speaking about that, we have another matchup, right? Like, right? Yeah, Lions Bucks. That was what I was segueing to. Another big game, and it, it, it's got to be another big win here. I mean, this is what it's got to be. You have to win this game. You're at home, and you have a team that you certainly can beat. You beat them not once but twice last year. You can do it again here uh, as you shake off the rust. And I, I expect this offense to be better in this game. And I don't think the Bucs are great defensively. I think they have some secondary questions that Jaden Daniels' first career start wasn't really able to expose last week. I yeah. think Jared Goff, Amon Ra St. Brown, Sam Laporta, those the, that trio gets in sync week two. I think we see a strong start from this offense and really probably a strong start to the second half. It was kind of an odd second half for Ben Johnson in the third quarter against the Rams, but I think they can get better this week. What are you expecting offensively from the Lions this week? I mean, I, I hope we see that right away. Uh, right. I like that. You know, you're carrying some momentum, the overtime momentum into into this matchup. Uh, the Buccaneers are going to be without Antoine Winfield, which is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Possibly without Kalijah Kansi, which is a big deal. And, um, you know, offensively, I think that, you know, you mentioned it. Amon Ra didn't have a, a great game. Um, didn't have a lot really thrown his way. Laporta didn't either, but JMO picked it up for them. Yeah. And he did it. He, you know, he just, he made a couple of plays that ended up being just huge plays for them. And then you got the running backs, right? So, um, I would hope, and I, I, you know, I fully expect to see a bunch of offenses around the NFL start to, you know, they're gonna they're gonna dial it in, they're gonna they're gonna figure things out, and they're gonna get rolling. Um, I hope the Lions start fast and get to a point where the crowd noise and and there's pressure on Mayfield um, to you know to make plays because they're down. You know, that's kind of like that's the perfect scenario uh, for me. As, is getting pressure on him because he's not going to be able to to do what Stafford did. He's not that yeah. kind of a player. He would yeah. prefer to hold the ball, scramble around, do a little bit of running. Um, you know, where where if there is kind of pressure, I don't expect there to be pressure like the kind of pressure the Lions put on the Rams on Sunday, but they're going to get pressure. They're they're going to be able to do that, and it's just a matter of how does May, how does Mayfield handle that kind of stuff and certainly not it's not going to be like the way Stafford handled it so no. we'll see you know I would um this is a really I don't know what you saw from Brian Branch but I really liked what I saw from how they utilized catch, him. catch the, the ball, ball though dude. right <laughs> yeah, dude he could have had two pick sixes he could have probably had three or four interceptions I you're you're absolutely right though he played great um love what I saw from him I, and I, I just want to shift over to the offense before we go to the defense one yeah. last time. Just on the uh, you know the the blitz and stunt rates here from Cody Alexander at match quarters, the 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 Rams and this was something I noticed watching the offense. The Rams ran line stunts twenty six point two percent of the time, which was tied for second most in the NFL in Week One. They did have some struggles there, and the the primary guy that I noticed was struggling was Graham Glasgow, and he was oversetting. Taylor Decker was kind of doing the same thing and, and getting too far inside and that looper would get on the outside shoulder of Taylor Decker. So that was causing some issues. Oddly enough, the Buccaneers ran pretty much close to a 22% of the time line stunts and they're a heavy blitz team. I mean, we know Todd Bowles, he's going to blitz 47.5% blitz rate in week yeah. one. I think maybe part of that had to do with a rookie quarterback, make him uncomfortable. I'm yeah. sure that percentage will come it down, him, yeah, but- but I, I would assume here uh, that the same thing may happen to Jared Goff. And, and that just means St. Brown should have a big day. Sam Laporta should have a big day. Get the ball out uh, quickly, please. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. then get ready get ready to run it with David Montgomery, which we saw and which I love. But moving to the defensive side of the football, you're right. Brian Branch really stepped up. We already talked a little bit about Tyrion Arnold. I do want to say this, though. I noticed Kirby Joseph at time was playing in-man coverage against Cooper Cup. 
please keep Kirby Joseph in the the middle half of the field and let him roam free yeah. on Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Let Brian Branch come down into the hole and, and get any crossing patterns, any dig route on Chris Godwin and those types of guys. I just want to see Kirby Joseph take the middle of the field and, and roam freely, please, because that, that was my biggest thing from the coverage standpoint. He was playing too much down in the box, playing too much man coverage. He doesn't need to do that. Let him track the football yeah. and play instinct football the way he does. And he's uh, phenomenal at tracking the ball and 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 making plays on the ball. Yes, he is. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting to bring him up because yeah. he's going to have to play he's going to have to play a strong game in the, in this matchup. The, the the Buccaneers I want to see, you you have, you probably have the numbers in front of you. I don't because you know, as a person who might have wanted to prepare for this thing, I did not. However, <laughs> I want to say Jalen McMillan, the rookie from Washington, ran the most routes of all of all of the Buccaneers receivers last week, which is crazy to think about, but it just speaks to how much they go to three wide receiver sets. Godwin's in the slot where he's a nightmare. He just is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then Mike Evans is, is Mike Evans out wide, your backside X or whatever, your outside X receiver. But McMillan, McMillan caught one pass. I want to say it was a 32-yard touchdown. He got overthrown or potentially dropped another one, which would have been like a 30 or 40-yard touchdown. So he's dangerous, right? They're, and they're playing him in, in a bit of a dangerous fashion, but he's out there a ton. So two things. One, if you play in dynasty formats in fantasy football, you might want to think about picking him up because at some point in time in the future, he might be the guy there or or a very large part of what they do. They took him in round three. And two, Kirby Joseph is going to need to play a strong game in coverage. And whoever it is that they determine they want to 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 uh you know to play over against Godwin will have to as well. My assumption yeah. is that's Robertson, but you know, I think that there's a variety of ways you can do that. It's just, you know, in coverage, they need to be solid against this team. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it looks like, according to Underdog Fantasy, he ran 88% of routes. So he ran a, a, a fair share of routes. And like you said, probably the most on the team. And you're right. You have to prepare for a guy like that because we've seen that in the past. I mean, remember the playoff game uh, against the Rams where everybody was like, who, you know, at that point you knew who he was, but you see a rookie receiver out there running a ton of routes and yeah. playing and making big plays. You're like, who the hell is Puka Nakua? Yeah. And the yeah. same thing happened early in the season to teams. They figured out who Puka was. And, and this could be the case with Tampa. You're going to figure out who Jalen McMillan is. So hopefully the Lions get ready for that and they don't make it where they're the team where they have Jalen McMillan have that breakout game. So I, I will say that. I guess it's more that you know they're going three wide, right? They're going to play. Right. They're only, it's like solely 11 personnel. And yeah. by the way, their running back is incredible catching the ball out of the backfield. So that's another issue. So yeah. Um, you know, I hope the like you said, I hope the Lions start fast on offense, and and um, you know, faster than they have. But that's going to be one of the keys is is putting Tampa into a situation where they got to, you know, they don't. There's not much art margin for for Tampa to win this game. They have to play a really good, strong game. Um, we're at a point where the Lions, if the Lions play a good game, they should win. They you know? they should. Yeah, yeah, no, a hundred, a hundred percent. They yeah. they should win the game if they just play the way that we've seen them play in the past. What we've seen in the last, I don't know, fourteen, fifteen months, the last two seasons, the last season and a half, whatever we want to call it. What we've seen, if they can play the, that way, we should see some positive results here. Um, and and I will say this, I, I got two last points. You know. I want to give kudos real quick, though, to Alex Anzalone. Great first game. He was really banged up to end last season. He had that article that came out on the Players' Tribune that I think people forgot and just kind of talking about the pride and taking the pride and, and all that stuff. So good to see him back. 13 tackles. He set the tone with that first hit on that swing route. Um, but I, I want to say, Amik Robertson debut, I thought he played pretty well. He had a good pass breakup in the middle of the field. He almost knocked down a screen pass, but he was five foot eight, and the Lions were outnumbered on that screen pass, three yeah. to two, uh, which was odd. But either way, 
I love the physicality from him. I love the way he plays. If if he's going to track anybody, it could be Jalen McMillan. Um, he could be in for a big day. I'd be really curious how that looks. I don't know if Carlton Davis is going to play though, so we'll see. Maybe Ennis Rakestraw gets a little bit more involved. But the last thing I want to say, heavyweight battle, Tristan Wirfs, maybe the best offensive tackle in football or you know, second or third best offensive tackle, depending on who you talk to. And he's got Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, this is going to be, this is right up our alley. I mean, get the lotion yeah. ready. Here we go. This is, this is going to be exciting. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, you know, look, Hutch, Hutch is so dominant and I know he doesn't always get home, but we, we saw some really big performances from him late last year and I think this is going to be just one of those where they go back and forth all game long. You know, I'm with you. I think that everybody wants him to be more productive in the sack column, but pressure is production, right? So yeah. Um, anytime you force a quarterback to be either uncomfortable or uh, un- uncomfortable or get off his spot, I think you're doing you're doing good things. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm fascinated to see is what this looks like with Reader in the middle of that defensive line and how much it changes or impacts those around him. So is he eating double teams? And if so, you know, Hutchinson will be isolated one-on-one and whoever, whoever, you know, Davenport will be isolated. Um, Whoever, you know, if it's McNeil or, or owns or whatever it is, you know, they'll have one-on-one opportunities. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a chance for them to expose Baker because Baker's playing great. He played great last year. Uh, he really had a strong year last year, but he is, he will, he will put the ball trying to make plays into dangerous places. And you can get him to do that with pressure and hitting him. So we'll see, you know, it, this is a, this is going to be a really fun matchup uh, and a fun game to watch. Absolutely. And I, and I think it's one of those where people need to remember too, that, the Buccaneers have a rookie starting center in Graham Barton who played very well in week one, but he's not necessarily playing the commander's defensive front that we've seen in the past with, you know, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, uh, Montez yeah. Sweat, and Chase Young. It's a little bit different. Now he's got all these different kind of animals to play against with, like you mentioned, Reader, McNeil, Hutch, uh, Levi Ozarike, Marcus Davenport, the, you know, Makai Wingo. Kyle Petko, there's quite a few different guys that he's going to have to get ready for. Uh, so it'll be interesting. And it should, like you mentioned, open up a lot of one-on-one battles on the perimeter. Um, yeah. Lastly, I, I know we got to get going, but lastly, who's one player or two players that you're really looking to watch for on Sunday? Um, if you need a minute, I got a guy, whatever, whatever go. floats your boat. Go. I, I'm going to... I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say Derek Barnes. And the reason I say that is because Derek Barnes had a stellar year last year. I did not think he played very well on tape in week one this year against the Rams. I thought he missed a couple tackles. I thought he had some bad angles. And this is a guy that they play down off the edge. They blitz him. They make him a mid-hook guy. He he wears multiple hats. In, and we know Anzalone's the primary number one, but Derek Barnes takes into reps of the young first round pick in Jack Campbell. If he's going to be on the field, he's going to have to play like a first round pick to justify him being on the field. I, I, I'm just afraid that he kind of plateau last year and that's as good as he's going to get. And then is he going to level off and kind of become Malcolm Rodriguez? What do we do with him? I don't want to see that. So I'm, I'm curious, does he have a big week with kind of a, a two headed monster in the backfield that the Bucks have with with White and, and, and the rookie Bucky Irving. So yeah, I'll be very curious what Derek Barnes does. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I'm I, So Jamison Williams is a little dinged up with an ankle injury. I don't know exactly what's going to happen with him. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, he had a huge game, right? And it's and it's it, the excitement with which he plays is super cool. But you yeah. saw how easy it is. Not easy. You saw how fast he can make a defensive back who looks like he's in position, get out of position and boom, touchdown. Yeah. And it's just, you know, so I, I have a suspicion that his production will come at the expense of other, I guess his, his production is going to come at the expense of Laporta and, and Amon Ross St. Brown. And that's fine. It's totally cool. Cause I don't yeah. expect golf to step up and throw, you know, 45 touchdown passes. Yeah. 
or you know, or 40 or whatever it is because because Jameson Williams emerges. But if if Williams can get on the field on Sunday, and again, he's got a little ankle thing going on. If he can, can he make two or three big plays? And if he can, it's going to be tough for Tampa. Yes. Yeah. His two or three big plays could be, you know, two catches for 70 yards and a touchdown and a 20 yard run. And those are, it's just, those are huge plays. So, yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of interested to see what the offense again looks like with him is as he can, as he, you know, hopefully continues this push. And on defense, I, you know, Tampa has a pretty good tight end. Um, it's Kate Otten and yeah. Lions have to prepare for him too. So it's not just the three wide receivers and Rashad White, Bucky Irving stuff. It's Baker running and the tight end up the seam sort of that you might forget about kind of stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is a tough matchup. This is, you know, this, these are two tough games to play back to back. These are teams. I expect the Rams to probably be in the playoffs. Uh, we'll see what injury kind of gives them. Maybe that's overreaching after week one a little, but they look good. Right. And I, I would imagine uh, Tampa Bay has to feel like they should win the NFC, or the NFC South. So, you know, the Lions come out of week two playing two, what I think may end up being playoff teams. Being 2-0 and oh is, a, is just an awesome start. It it is it really is, and I was gonna piggyback off what you said, and now I can't. Oh, I will lastly piggyback off of the JMO stuff. Week one, they were taking some shots downfield. We saw the deep touchdown. We saw another deep touchdown attempted pass. We saw the crossing route to JMO. So, like you mentioned, two or three big plays. Maybe that's all it's going to take. They'll hit St. Brown underneath a bunch and get somebody to bite, and JMO will be deep down the field for a couple of big plays. That's that's kind of the hope, the fingers crossed type deal. We would yeah. love to know what you guys think. Who's the player to watch for on Sunday against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Let us know in the comments below right here on the Detroit Lions podcast. You can do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all other podcast platforms. Just go ahead and comment. And while you're there, go ahead, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And of course, if you don't want to do that, you can find us on Twitter or X at Russ NFL Draft at Bischoff underscore Scott. Be sure to smash the follow button and let us know what you're thinking of the Lions and what you think of our preview and our review of the games that are going on because that's what we're doing now. So we're kind of back into the swing of things. We're seeing things in live time. Um, so we're, we're happy to be back. We're going to be doing this. It's it's always fun. Scott, you got anything else to add? Nope. I think I've counted enough. We're good. Yeah, no, I'm good. We are good. Uh, he's Scott Bischoff. I'm Russ Brown. This is Bischoff and Brown. We will be back next week, hopefully with the Lions being 2-0. Until then, we'll see you right here on the Detroit Lions podcast.